Okay, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the uh, webinar for uh, the networks group in, in Queen Mary. So I'm the chair of this webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Joseph Doyle. I'm a lecturer in the networks research group here at uh, Queen Mary. So just kind of some quick housekeeping announcements for the webinar. So if you'd like to ask questions, please do, we welcome them. Uh, but if you could do so through the Q&A uh, panel in the uh, Zoom platform, that would be great so that we could um, mark them off to be answered uh, by the appropriate presenters uh, at the Q&A session, which will take place after the presentations. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Steve Ulick, who will introduce the uh, Networks Research Group. Thank you, Joseph. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'll be very short and really introduce the, the group, but most from the academic side of things, rather than do an introduction that introduces the talks themselves. So. Uh, I'm the head of a group since 2012. Now I will become the head of uh, school, so uh, I'll be uh, handling a bit more than just a group. So uh, the group is really made of 15, 16 academic staff. Uh, some of them belong to the joint program we have with BUPT. Uh, it doesn't really matter, and that's more a matter of contract. Uh, and uh, this is the list of the academic staff that uh, are within the group with the topic that uh, they actually uh, must uh, contributing to. Uh, and when you look at that, well, you can see there is a lot of diversity in what we do. So it's a large group. So we have 16 academics and we do a lot of things ranging from mathematics, applied mathematics up to systems and even hardware and a bit everything in the middle. Uh, so it's that's why we call the networks group because if if it really hand, handles anything that's related to networks and networks can be the real ones or more abstract type of networks. So uh, I will uh, show in the next slide more a type of a word cloud view so that that's a bit easier to make sense of the different topics because I don't have time to go through every single uh, staff member and what they do. So we have 16 uh, academics, about 30 PhD students, that depends over time, and five postdocs, or more or less that. So in terms of what we do really, well, obviously in the middle, you've got the word internet, hopefully, uh, because it's kind of one of those important networks. Uh, and then what we do about it is anything that ranges from, like could be cognitive networks, internet of things, uh, uh, network science, uh, it can be big data, network management, network monitoring, uh, programmable networks. So it's a bit of everything, or it captures almost, I think, everything that is related to networks as an abstract entity. Now, we don't do wireless or specifically wireless or mobile networks, which is what another group, the CSR group, is actually specialized in. Uh, oops, I think there is an issue with my slides. Sorry. So, all right. So uh, now let's focus on, sorry, because it matters, the type of research grants or so the, the research problems for which we have funding, but I've put only the big ones uh, because I had to choose among them. Uh, but uh, that doesn't capture everything what we do. So we have plenty of other grants. So uh, that's uh, grants that were the older ones. So Endeavor, that was a, a Horizon 2020, a EU project uh, that we were actually coordinating here at Queen Mary that was really about software-defined networking. That was followed by Earl, that was also about S SDNs so or software-enabled networking. Uh, we also have uh, a large EPSA project that is uh, led uh, internally here within the group uh, by uh, Gareth about uh, social decision making uh, for internet standards with Glasgow. Uh, we also have uh, EPSA starting grants and we have plenty of smaller grants, or, but here I have a few minutes and I don't want to spend too much time uh, explaining all the grants, all the things we do, just more to give a pitch or an idea of the type of things we're doing. Now, in terms of publication venues, uh, 
we try to put the high really high. So in terms of conferences, we publish at ACM SIGCOM, SIGMOD, SIGMetrics. In terms of social network, the best conferences are ICWSM dot dot dot. There is actually Infocom in Applied Mathematics, CC Grid for more systems cloud type of topics. And in terms of journals, it's the transactions, the best transactions that are uh, present in networking, transactions on networking, JSAC. We also have plus one because people like, for example, Raoul Mondragon are doing uh, more uh, standard, uh, uh, sorry, complex networks type of topics, or we have also actually Internet of Things. So that captures more or less the type of publications in terms of quality where we actually aim to publish. So that will be it for me. So we can move now to the talks. So it's back to you, Joseph. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker uh, who will be giving his talk on big data temporal graph systems with Raftery, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Clegg. So whenever you're ready, Richard, take it away. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, Joseph. Let me get my uh, correct camera on this. Ah, there we go. Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so I'm uh, talking about Raftery, which is a big data system for dynamic graphs. Uh, there's quite a few people in the group working on this project, uh, listed there alphabetically, not in order of how much work they've put in. Um, so what's the project we've got here? Here, we're talking about graphs in the, the most uh, networks in the most abstract sense. So we might have a familiar kind of online social network where a node is a user and a link is that user tweeting to another user, perhaps. We might think about, nowadays, we might think about um, an encounter network. The nodes, again, are people, but we create a link when they physically meet. And we can see there that might be important in disease transmission, which we're a lot thinking about these days. Uh, we might think of a transport network, a node, an airport, a link, a plane flying between them. Um, so very, very general sense of the word network. The key challenge here, there's no commonly used tool that's uh, available that can cope with these graphs when they change in time. So loads and loads of people study these graphs when they're static, when you just have a fixed graph or you've looked at a graph that's grown to a point in time. But when these graphs are growing and constantly changing, there's no widely used analysis tool for that. Uh, our solution is a bit of software called Raftery. We've been developing that for uh, four years now. Works on the cloud, it's open source, it's a big data system, and it deals with these time-changing graphs. Right now, it's working, we're getting use cases. It needs the application programmer interface, the way that people interact with it refining. It needs proper documentation, it needs testing on large use cases, but we're at a very exciting time with this research. Um, so what sort of things are we doing? One project we're working in with the University of Cambridge is about how words change over time. So our database, our graph is words connected by their occurrence together in uh, literature. And we look at things like, for example, the word Blackberry used to mean fruit, came to mean a communications device. And now it's going back to being fruit again as the Blackberry is a bit less successful. Um, but uh, we're looking at cryptocurrency where here the node so our people, a link is transactions between them where they move Bitcoins about. And we have a system that I think is state of the art at uh, working out when these transactions represent attempts to obfuscate this movement of money because cryptocurrency does unfortunately have some fraudulent activity. We're working with uh, City University there and a company called Chainalysis. Uh, Urban Analytics, we're working with Institute for Transport Studies at Leeds, and we're looking at uh, assessing schemes designed to influence how people travel, and we're using our system to work out whether those schemes genuinely produced a user response that changed as a result of their intervention. And finally, uh, we've been looking into social networks, and in particular, we've been looking at the, the a lot of people worried about the alt-right these days, and we're looking at a network called Gab, where people go if they're a bit too extreme for Twitter. And we're, we're going to move our investigation on to look at how extremism spreads on social media. Um, 
Okay, so there's a few links there. We've got a GitHub page. We've got a website. There's also a spin-out company. I think it's up to uh, three employees now called Choreograph, which is pushing forward the open source project. And we're currently seeking a uh, grant to, to fund Queen Mary and Choreograph working on that together. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's all I've got to say. So I'll stop my screen share. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so next up we have... Uh... Abdul Wahab, who's a PhD student here, who'll be giving a talk on network emulation for pre precise uh, QOE evaluation. So whenever you're ready. Um, Abdul, your mic is muted if you are talking. Okay, I think you're okay, Abdul. Now, if you'd like to share your screen again. Yeah. Um, uh, is it all right now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Joseph. Um, I will be presenting uh, my project, which is Enhanced QA Assessment of Multimedia Streaming Applications. I'm working under Dr. John Showmans, and I'm working along, along Nafi Ahmed as a PhD student in Networks Group. So uh, if we see in the past few years, the internet usage has changed a lot. Uh, introduction of a lot of new applications like Netflix and Twitch has caused a lot of uh, uprise in the network traffic, which has caused us to, which has brought us in an in a environment, in a society where the user experience is very important for the customer, uh, for the business uh, success. So based on that, clearly, uh, assessment is happening since uh, a very long time, but we tried to improve it. And for that, we acquired some cellular measurements from uh, from our uh, industrial partner, Tagens, and we tried to model down those industrial or those uh, cellular measurements. And we find out that jitter and delay it follows a lot normal distribution. And we tried to find out the QOE distributions from a given uh, cost distribution, which can enhance the evaluation of quality of experience from for different stakeholders like network provider and the content provider. Then if we, oh, yeah. Then um, traditionally cost to QA evaluation is always done by mapping and mean opinion score is, or MOS is used, usually the tool taken as a, a standard to present quality of experience as a metric. We find out the limitations of MOS as MOS takes away all the user diversity and the information from, from the metric itself. And it negates the whole point of uh, involvement of a user in the, in the involvement in the, in the success of the business. So we presented our, uh, our QA metrics as distributions and we presented our results as standard, standard, uh, standard deviation of opinion score. We demonstrated uncertainty in cost as well that can take place due to sampling errors and other errors that takes place uh, when we determine costs like delay or jitter. And we tried to find out how the, these uh, losses or how does these uncertainties propagates to QE. In our uh, research, we find out that there are high chances that at low packet losses and low delay values, the QE evaluation will be highly variable. And it is important for the business point of view to include the variation in quality of experience to enhance the user experience as well as the service, uh, service provider's point of view as well, that they need to uh, figure out a value or a, a, a certain magnitude at which a certain thing can be uh, acceptable for the users. Moving forward, we also developed a tool uh, as a network emulator, uh, which is used commonly in industry as well as in uh, industry as well as in academia. A lot of uh, different at, at a lot of different occurrences. 
that a, a network emulator can be used to emulate the network behavior and then the network emulator can be used to emulate the network behavior and then carry out quality of experience uh, tests and experiments. So uh, we developed a new network emulator, which um, includes the correlation between different network parameters like delay, jitter, and loss. And this new emulator has improved the realistic network evaluation in a way that it, in, uh, it considers the buffer and can emulate a bursty loss as well. We demonstrated this using uh, objective QA matrices like VMAF or TSNR and demonstrated that the performance actually improves when you use a correlated emulator rather than just using a, a traditional emulator. So this emulator, we are planning to make it public as well, and uh, there, are more, uh, there are more chances of um, improvement in it, which we are working on it. And um, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Abdul. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. S Dr. Sebastiano Miano, who will be giving a talk on programming the network. So whenever you're ready. All right, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay, thanks, Joseph. So um, today, I will uh, just tell you a little bit of uh, history of uh, the evolution of data center networks uh, and what we are currently working on. So as we all know, data centers, uh, um, uh, today an increasing amount of companies, uh, large or even small companies are relying on data center to provide uh, customized services to their uh, end users. Now, this uh, data center can run different type of applications uh, ranging from uh, web applications to database uh, or even machine learning tasks. Now, a data center is composed of uh, uh, different switches and routers uh, that provide connectivity to several uh, uh, thousand of uh, uh, hundreds of uh, servers that are running inside the data center. Now, those uh, switches and routers uh, are mainly composed of a fixed hardware pipeline and um, logic, uh, a switch logic, which is basically uh, how to program the switch, uh, which was embedded inside the switch itself. Now, this in the past has caused a lot of problems for network administrators since in order to program the, the data center network, they have to ask, uh, access every single device independently in order to understand or program the network behavior. Now, a first step towards a more fine-grained control of the network was the introduction of the software-defined networking concept, where basically uh, we started decoupling the logic of the switch outside of the switch itself. This allowed the operators to um, provide a better control of the network by, um, let's say, handling or programming every single device from, uh, device from a single point of uh, control. But it, is the, it has still the problem of a limited customization since we are relying still on a fixed hardware pipeline. Today, with the introduction of uh, programmable hardware, we can see how um, it is possible not only to program the behavior of a switch, but also to program how the switch can process packets. Now, in the recent years, uh, our research group has focused the attention of this, uh, on this uh, latest trend by, let's say, enabling a data center network uh, to program their behavior, introducing some functionalities inside the switch, inside the network itself. For instance, we explore the possibility to let the switch uh, decide how to detect uh, a congested link inside the network and then uh, redirect the traffic accordingly, or for instance, how to extract uh, customized information from the packets uh, that are more useful for the application that is running inside the data center. Now, to bring this level of uh, programmability and customization even further, we are currently exploring the possibility to enhance not only um, the switches with programmable hardware, but also soft, um, servers with programmable network interface cards. 
For instance, uh, this can allow us to uh, offload some processing um, of the server inside the in NIC itself by um, uh, before packet center inside, inside the, uh, the server. Or for instance, to enhance the performance of uh, virtualization, uh, um, uh, virtualization functions that are running inside the server. Uh, all of this uh, with the goal of uh, reducing, of course, the computational expenses uh, inside the server, um, uh, whose uh, resources can be then uh, dedicated to other processing tasks uh, uh, um, beyond uh, packet processing uh, uh, as we did uh, in the past years. So that's all. Thank you very much, Spassiano. So next up, we have uh, Naomi Arnold, who's a PhD student in the Networks Group, and she'll be giving a talk on understanding how networks evolve VITA. I think you... Hi, um, uh, am I unmuted now? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Naomi Arnold. I'm a PhD student in the Networks Group, working with um, Richard Clegg and Roald Mondragon. And I'm excited to tell you about my PhD project. So um, uh, when I talk about networks, we mean it in the most sort of general sense of so looking at a system of interacting objects, which we might, might model as nodes and links. So as an example, we might have a, a social network, whether that's online or offline, where um, the nodes are, are people and um, the edges are some interaction between them. And uh, we might have a computer network where the nodes are uh, computers and, and the links might be a physical cable between them. Or we might have something like citation networks where um, the nodes are a, a document and um, the links are some reference between them or one site and the other one. And um, uh, what I look at in my uh, PhD project is how, um, how we can model networks and so one thing we might look at as part of the model is, is how links form in a network. So as an um, example, um, imagine I'm a, a node in the Twitter network and I'm joining Twitter for the first time and looking at who I might initially connect to. So first, first thing I might do is um, connect to a big hub. So um, I see, for example, the QMX network, which has a large number of followers and um, might connect to them to sort of kickstart. Um, my, my links. And then um, another thing that I might do is look at who um, QMX is following and see that they're following uh, data science QME well and give those a follow as well. Um, and that this aspect is called um, triangle closure where we have triangles of connected nodes. And then another thing I might do is um, connect to some accounts more randomly. Um, and so uh, random connections might, might be a more uh, simple network model. And um, these uh, different ways of, of, of making connection um, so within the network can be combined into um, a, a model for a network's evolution. So um, in the main questions of, of my project are how we can um, model network evolution using um, mechanisms like these. And uh, more recently, we've been looking at how we can use these network models to um, detect change points in, in networks. And um, for example, uh, we've been looking at a, a historic data set and looking at the effects of some large, large events on, on an email network of a, of a company. And you might use it to look at if a social network perhaps introduces a new feature, how that might change interactions between users. And so the project so far, we've um, uh, developed some software for, um, called the FETA software, which stands for Framework for Evolving Topology Analysis, um, which is a toolkit for working with some um, network models and real data. And we've worked with quite a wide variety of data sets from online social networks to um, citation networks. 
So uh, thank you for listening. I'm, I've left up some links there, and uh, one of them is a link to a recent preprint that we've we've got on this one. Thanks, thanks very much, Naomi, for that for that excellent talk. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Mona Jabber, who's giving a talk on uh, machine learning enabled mobile network performance management based on streaming CDR data. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So thanks a lot for, for coming to this talk. Today I'll be talking about a machine learning approach that uses CDR data towards zero touch networks. And in this context, we're talking about mobile networks and we're talking about recent mobile networks which have become more complex than what we've ever seen before. This is due to the internet of things and to the uh, many advanced applications that we have in 5G and the ones that we will have in 6G. So why is machine learning needed and why CDR is a good uh, starting point? Um, to understand uh, mobile networks and the complexity of optimizing these networks towards zero touch, let's have a look at uh, what mobile networks look like in the beginning. And um, so mobile networks are made of three subsystems. The radio axis are the cells. So these are the antennas that you see on the streets. These connect to the core network through a backhole access. The core network is where the switching takes place uh, through these MSCs, uh, which are the mobile switches. Now, traditionally, each one of these subsections was optimized separately in a kind of silo approach, mostly driven by people, so network experts who are doing this optimization. With 5G and beyond, we cannot do that anymore. We need a holistic approach that looks at the whole network as one entity. And for that, we need tools, advanced tools, such as machine learning and artificial intelligence that will help us to do this optimization. And this is the work that we have done. So we've used CDR data. These are call data records, originally collected for billing. These uh, take place at the core network. And they are a very interesting data source because they have information about the users. So the phone numbers of the users, um, the empty of the users, it has information about the network. This is including the radio, the core network, and also the backhole network. Also information about the mobile device hardware. So which hardware is it, uh, is it using? And it has an interesting information that will help us in the diagnosis of the problem, which is the cause of termination of every one of these calls. So this is a great source. However, it is very sensitive data. And it's sensitive because it has information about the users, so we can locate users, know their numbers, who they call, where they are. And also it has sensitive information about the network itself, which renders the network um, vulnerable. And for that reason, before we can do any intelligent work or any useful work with CDR data, we need to go through an anonymization process. To this end, we have access to CDR data from a GSM network, so this is a very early mobile network and uh, we've done CDR aggregation to anonymize the users. And what we've done is for each one of the cells in the network, we have aggregated all the calls through one hour and we've created these rows that you see here. In each row, we have a cell hour. So this is all the calls within one cell within one hour and we've extracted interesting features that will help us in the diagnosis from the row CDR data. Each three rows were grouped into a segment and then these segments were allocated a label using machine learning and the label will indicate whether this cell is performing well or is underperforming. We're interested in those that are not performing well and these are the last three rows here. So we've plotted the number of cells that are underperforming over the hours of the day. And uh, with that, we can extract trends to identify what are the trends within this network uh, where cells are underperforming. And we want to identify the root cause of this problem. And for that, we've grouped cells with similar trends under different groups, going from five hours down to three hours of a similar behavior. For each one of these groups, we look at two levels and we look at the greatest common descriptor. So it is common about all these cells that are having a similar problem. From a network point of view, so this is from the mobile network point of view, 
where the smallest scale would be a cell level and the highest scale will be the network level, which could be an MSC, so one switch or maybe more than one switch. We also look at the geographical um, landscape and we try to understand what's the greatest common descriptor from that point of view. And in this case, the larger scale is countrywide, where the country is divided into four sections. It could be divided into more. This is just one example. And then the smallest scale will be a given neighborhood in a city. How do we work with this greatest common descriptor? We look at these groups that we've created earlier. And for example, if I take this group here, I have 130 cells that have a similar behavior. And this is an underperformance behavior. I look at the greatest common descriptor from a network point of view, and I find that one of the, um, all of these cells belong to the same MSC. From a geographical point of view, I find that all of them are in this section of the network. Looking at this problem together with a domain expert, we understand that there was a failure in this MSC, so this is the switch. And this failure uh, caused all the cells to be out of service temporarily. And this is what has caused all of these uh, bad performance and dropped calls in the network. So this is one example of what can be done with CDR data using machine learning. This is a step towards zero touch networks. And we have demonstrated that CDR driven machine learning based root cause analysis is possible and is promising. We look forward to having more data and uh, more opportunity to validate uh, this approach again. Thanks for listening and I'd be very happy to take all your questions. Thank you very much, Mona. So next up, we have uh, Hengde Yin, who will yeah. be giving a, who's a PhD student here, who will be giving a talk on the simplification of networks via their path diversity. Okay, I uh, see my PowerPoint. Um, can, can, you, can you see that? I can, yeah. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Heng Da. So it's my pleasure to have this presentation and this talk. So this is also my uh, part of my PhD uh, research. So the title is Simplification of Networks by Conserving Paths, Diversity and Minimization of the Search Information. So uh, imagine now we are locating in a strange city, how difficult for us to navigate in this city and how difficult for us to find a street from another street among all the other paths how much information do we need to know if we want to navigate um, in ourselves from the source to the destination in this network? Especially in 21st century, we are facing to a world with massive information. So here, our aim is to um, here our aim is to consider a network from a view of traveler, but from a view of the, sorry, uh, from the not from the view of a traveler, but from the view of the network operator. We want to describe the path diversity and the navigability of a network with all its path diversity in a concise way. That is, the network can be navigable with the minimal information. So why path diversity is important? Because it is related to the alternative path, which can maintain the information flow when a path is not available. However, it, uh, it is challenging because the number of the alternative paths could be very huge. And we combine two methods to achieve our aim. The first one is the trick contraction uh, algorithm. It simplifies a network to a smaller network where both networks have the same number of data of paths. It aggregates those nodes that do not contribute to the alternative path into the super node with some restriction. And the network which describes the connectivity of the super node is the skeleton network. However, the skeleton network is not unique depending on the sequence of link contraction. And here is an example to show we have the same original network, but we have totally different skeleton network. And that is why we apply the search information because we want to find out which skeleton network is the easiest one to describe all the path diversity of a network via the minimum search information. And then during the experiments, we find the skeleton network and the super nodes both contribute to the search information. And the situation, uh, the information we needed, we needed to know to navigate a network is the sum of the search information within the skeleton and all its super nodes. 
and we find a balance between the skeleton and the supernodes that it can effectively minimize the search information of the simplified network. That is, we expect it to have a smaller skeleton network and an average size of the supernodes. And this is a very easy example to show. This is a ring network. And if we can have three supernodes with each has three nodes inside, we can have the minimize, minimal search information. And also, um, we find a scaling behavior between the search information of the original network and the minimal search information skeleton network. This allows us to evaluate the search information for large networks with less computational cost. And this figure shows that we can approximate the search information of a large network from a skeleton network with a reasonable relative error by the square dash line. And then finally, the skeleton network and the supernodes can be considered as a map of network which can be used to understand the relationships among alternative paths of the original network. Mm, for example, this is a TFL, um, uh, the Transport for London network, and we can have different maps which are the skeleton networks, which are the B and the D. And we can understand how the supernodes looks like the C and E and how they are connected with each other, for example, in this uh, D. This can further help us to make routing decisions in the future. So the conclusion here is that we introduce a method that can describe all the past diversity of a network via the minimal information and more details can be found in the paper below. And thanks for your listening. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Hengda. So next up, we have uh, the last talk, uh, last but not least, uh, we have a PhD student at the Networks Group, Said Gafori, who will be giving a talk on resource, sorry, learning resource management in cloud computing. So uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Said Rafuri. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Networks Group at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm working with Dr. Joseph Doyle. I'm going to present learning resource management in cloud computing. Cloud computing uh, is the computing paradigm that have substituted the need to have uh, dedicated resources with a pay-as-you-go service. Cloud providers maintain a big pool of uh, cloud uh, resources with easy to access APIs and web interfaces, which are also able to dynamically uh, scale. And the cloud computing paradigm uh, also enables on-demand access to resources uh, with low server downtime. The two big player in the cloud computing are now uh, Google Cloud Engine and uh, Amazon AWS. Efficient use of uh, valuable resources is an important issue both from the cloud provider and cloud user point of view. This is due to reduction of processing time, uh, reducing the energy consumption and reduction in total amount of costs spent on a given tasks. Container uh, are an isolated packaged unit, uh, pa packaged unit of software, which provide a lightweight and secure way of delivering softwares. Containers alongside virtual machines are also the main resource management tool in data centers. Container orchestration refers to sets of platforms that manage the life cycle of containers. The life cycle includes provisioning and deployment, scaling up or removing containers, health monitoring, and almost everything we need to use, uh, we need to use uh, in order to use the containers in production. Two of these capabilities are resource management and container migration, which enables efficient use of resources with its uh, resource management capabilities, improving these two capability with machine learning is a topic of our research. Two of the main player uh, in cloud orchestration are uh, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. We are currently doing uh, our experiments based on Kubernetes. Several goals and methods have been presented uh, for the resource management in cloud computing. Uh, some of the goals are consolidation, auto scaling, struggle and mitigation. Uh, in our current research, our focus is on the consolidation goal, which refers to packing the containers into the minimum number of physical servers in order to, 
in order to turn off the idle or underutilized servers. Due to the unpredictable data center resource usage, dynamic methods need to be adaptable to the usage of uh, resources over changes of uh, resource usage over time. Several methods has also been used for re resource allocation, including heuristic methods, evolutionary and nature inspired methods, supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithm and reinforcement learning. In our research, our focus is uh, on using reinforcement learning methods. Reinforcement le <coughs> learning method that uh, is a learning method that involves an agent receiving rewards and in a for reward from the environment, which that rewards is an indicator of the action value of each action values and the agents tries to improve its action based on the received reward. Deep reinforcement learning is uh, the same idea, but with the use of uh, powerful deep learning uh, feature extraction tool set and using the neural network as a function estimator for the actions. To sum up, we first uh, focus on detecting several challenges in the cloud computing and container orchestration framework. We define our scheduling goals subjected to uh, optimizing one of the objectives like consolidation. Uh, we then combine each of deep reinforcement learning according to the problem. There are uh, many variations of reinforcement learning like policy-based method, value-based method, multi-agent RL and model-based reinforcement learning each with different specification. Currently, we are using policy-based methods uh, because, of their good, because they are a good fit to our problem and they pass successes in systems research domain. And finally, we combine one or more optimization goal with one, of, uh, one or more deep reinforcement learning method to build an intelligent cloud resource scheduler, which is able to learn and improve itself over time and achieve higher performance in each of its objectives. Thanks for your attention. If you're interested in our research, please keep in, keep in touch and check out my GitHub repository for our ongoing projects.